Welcome. After more than two years of conflict, Syria appears to be breaking apart and drawing neighboring states into a fight which has already taken 70,000 lives and made a million refugees. We will ask, is it too late for the U.S. to play a positive role? And we'll learn about Syrian culture to better understand the war and to appreciate what's being lost. And prompted by the work of a war photographer, we'll reflect on another conflict which made us wary of Mideast interventions, Iraq. Also on the program, remember that multi-million dollar heist from all the ATMs in New York? Turns out it's an organized, vertically integrated business. And in our public intellectual segment, which looks at new research that can change our minds and public policy, we'll cast doubt on a sacred cow, home ownership. To begin, though, Syria. Does peace have a chance? Joining us via Skype from Washington, Vali Nasser. He is dean of the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, served in the Obama State Department, taught at the Naval War College, and is author of The Dispensable Nation, American Foreign Policy in Retreat. With us as well, Jonathan Holt Shannon, anthropologist at Hunter College. He's on the faculty of the CUNY Grad School's Mideast Center, and Professor Shannon is also a novelist, author of A Wintry Day, and other works that offer an intimate view of Syrian life. Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much for joining us. Good to be with you. And Vali Nasser, I'll begin with you. First on the news of the recent days, this latest Syrian army push into what's been rebel-held territory, is it conceivable that the rebels are beginning to lose the war? Not yet. I think they still hold uh, to a great deal of territory, and the Assad regime is quite far from reestablishing control over all of uh, Syria. However, it is a symbolic uh, reversal of fortune for the rebels, and it does. it is a psychological blow to them and a psychological boost to the Assad regime. It also challenges many of the assumptions of uh, uh, countries outside the United States, Europe, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, who have assumed that Assad is about to fall and may now have to think that this is a longer game and, it, and uh, you know, the fall of Assad is not necessarily imminent, which also should compel them to get, take Syria much more seriously. What are the implications for the United States of that analysis? And have you been a proponent of U.S. intervention through arming the rebels or any other means? I think the United States is now at a point where it can no longer really ignore Syria. It cannot assume that this conflict is going to get resolved soon, that Assad is going to go, and basically we can just stand aside and let this play itself out. There's not too much pressure from varieties of quarters on the administration to change course. I am favorable for the United States to take a leadership role. This does not mean an invasion of Syria or putting troops on the ground or anything like Iraq. It means, A, taking the humanitarian crisis seriously, which means that we ought to minimize the impact of the Syria war on neighbors of Syria, which are really now under threat from the refugees, because the number and the situation of the refugees is reaching a point that is a danger to Jordan, Turkey, and Lebanon. We can take a leadership role to address that issue. We need to put a lot more muscle into the diplomacy. Secretary Kerry has begun that uh, after a long time that the United States was missing in action in diplomacy, but we still have ways to go. But diplomacy is only going to be successful if Assad sees that the rebels have real material support from the outside. He has to calculate that he's not going to win this war and that the rebels could potentially win it, and only then he will take uh, negotiations seriously. So we really cannot adopt a diplomatic role without adding some muscle to the, to the rebels. That does not mean direct American military intervention. It just means that we need to be engaged far more than we have been. And I'll come back to you in a minute. But I want to have a different kind of conversation with you, because we tend in this country to talk about Syria in abstract and geopolitical terms. Um, even as we were just doing with uh, Professor Nasser, you know, informed us as he is. What are you hearing from your friends and other people you know in Aleppo, in the cafes? Are there still cafes in Aleppo? What are they talking about? 
Thank you, Brian. Yes, indeed, this is a humanitarian disaster of enormous scale, and it's unimaginable for most Americans uh, when we think about uh, over 100,000 killed and injured, over a million refugees, over 3 million internally displaced. It's hard to really understand that. Professor Nusser's points are well taken. However, one issue with uh, political analyses from afar is that they tend to abstract the population as Syrians, when in fact these are individuals, mothers, children, fathers, brothers, cousins, friends, um, who are trying to navigate a very uh, difficult and tricky terrain as this conflict unfolds. Uh, and I think uh, too often in these analyses, the human dimension of this is absolutely lost. And it's absolutely urgent that we do something now to address it. Uh, the cafes do exist. Uh, one problem with the mainstream media is that it tends to focus on disaster. Um, and certainly there's a lot of disaster there. We see images of whole neighborhoods destroyed, classical buildings um, demolished in places like Aleppo uh, and Homs and elsewhere. But I was surprised to learn from a friend who had visited uh, Homs to visit family members there that uh, she posted on her Facebook page a picture of her at a cafe smoking a, a narguile, which is a water pipe. And I thought, when was this? She said, it was just yesterday. Uh, I'm alive. So let me interrupt yeah. you for a second because we're going to put up a photo yeah. that you took mm -hmm. uh, in Aleppo. So what are we looking at? Is this one of those cafes? Actually, this is a cafe which sadly no longer exists. This is a Muntada across from the, the Martyr Square in Aleppo. And these are three of my close friends, all musicians, uh, two of them directors of conservatories, one uh, uh, a well-known violin player. Uh, uh, the gentleman on the right is now in exile in uh, Alexandria, Egypt, having fled after a very difficult crossing from his neighborhood in a traditional neighborhood controlled by the government through a series of checkpoints to get to the airport. So the most difficult and harrowing journey he's ever had to take in his life. And now lives perhaps for, uh, permanently in exile. The others live uh, uh, in various neighborhoods in, in Damascus or in, in Aleppo. So if we could roll back the clock and they were in this shot today, in this cafe, what do you think they would be saying about, let's say, Western intervention? Do they want American arms uh, to go into the hands of the rebels? Is that not even the question that they're asking themselves? Look, it's kind of a, a proverb that Syrians eat history and politics um, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner the way we eat it for dessert. And so likely they would be talking about politics. They would be very skeptical of an American intervention. Of those three individuals there, they're from three very different orientations uh, within the city of Aleppo. One, a pro-regime supporter. Uh, another, from a Christian population that would be considered by most analysts to be quite fragile, although he's very much in favor of the revolution. And the other person who's left, who was a government employee, but uh, was forced to leave. Uh, they would be uh, quite cynical of uh, international intervention because of the long history of false promises and uh, inaction on the part of the West and the so-called world community. And yet they would help for something, some sort of help, um, of humanitarian assistance, of what we used to call politics and diplomacy, um, horse trading and arm twisting, that doesn't seem to be happening anymore. Let's, and let's they're the ones who are the victims of that. Let's show another of your images. What are we looking at here? We're looking at the glorious Umayyad Mosque, or Great Mosque of Aleppo. That minaret you see there no longer exists because it was destroyed in uh, recent weeks. Uh, it was built in uh, about 1400 when it was destroyed by the Mongols. Um, this is a place of worship, but it was also a point of repair. I got an email from a friend in Buenos Aires who's an Aleppan Jew. And he said his father, when he moved to Buenos Aires um, many, many years ago, said he used to uh, walk around and hear the, the church bells in Buenos Aires because they reminded him of the call to prayer from the, the Aleppo's great mosque. And he had great nostalgia for his hometown of Aleppo. Would that mosque or that minaret have been a target uh, on purpose? We've been hearing about groups going after each other's mosques in Iraq, for example. Yes. Or would it have just been in the way of some other military agenda? It's hard to say. I can see how it might have been a target to instigate uh, a further crisis and division amongst the various communities in Aleppo. Uh, I can only hope that it was just an inadvertent loss, uh, but it's tragic. Professor Nasser, there was the announcement with some fanfare last week of Secretary of State Kerry coming to an agreement with the Russians to hold a peace conference, and hopefully that would result in a transitional government. And one of the reasons that was such big news is that the Russians have been so resistant uh, against cooperating with the West on this and backing up the Assad regime for various reasons. Did you see that as a breakthrough? And did the military push in the last few days by Assad make such a peace conference less likely? I think the Russians were interested in being part of an international conversation. After all, they 
would like the fighting to stop. But I don't think they have uh, come to a conclusion that Assad is necessarily falling or that they would support a transitional government. I think uh, also the facts on the ground uh, is not helping the rebels. It's actually helping Assad. It would, if, if, the, if the conference were to be held right now, the perception is that the rebels are not doing well, that the government is on the offensive. It's not clear why he would see any wisdom in, uh, in stepping down. And I think part of the argument is that before we get to a conference, there has to be some uh, credible uh, um, threat from the rebels to him backed by the West. He has to think that if he doesn't cut a deal, that then we will really well, arm the rebels, or that if he doesn't cut a deal, he could lose and get much less than what he would at the uh, peace conference. I don't think those elements are there. This is not properly conceived. We're talking about diplomacy without putting any muscle that would be persuasive to Assad to actually cut a deal, or the Russians to cut a deal. I want to ask both of you, and Professor Nasser, you first. How much do you think this conflict in Syria is about religion on any level? And how much is it about money, land, and power? Well, I think it's, uh, I would say it's about something else uh, at some level. And that's about uh, uh, identity. In other words, uh, identity, as we saw in Iraq, could be uh, among some groups conceived of as uh, in terms of their religion. And the Assad regime, I think, went out of its way to identify this conflict as between the Sunnis and, and his Alawite community. Uh, from the pattern in which he would attack mosques during uh, the holy month of Ramadan during the first year of the conflict. And I think, you know, that you have communities that, that at least are perceived to be or, or view themselves uh, along these identity lines. And, uh, and therefore, the fight is over uh, between... It's, it's an ethnic fight, in a sense, uh, except the, the language of ethnicity here is in, is in terms of sectarian identity. So it's not about whether you believe in God or it's not a dispute over liturgy and theology. It is dispute over power uh, by communities whose identity comes from their religion. We just have another minute or two. Professor Shannon, same question. It's important for us to remember that from the very beginning, this conflict was one of, uh, of an oppressed people against a tyrannical regime. Their quest was not religious supremacy or identity, but dignity. And the Syrians have been fighting um, for dignity and for self-determination against a criminal and corrupt regime um, that well exceeds the limits of the current president, Bashar al-Assad, and goes back many decades. Uh, it has turned into a conflict, but I think religion, sect, uh, ethnicity are all proxies for larger issues of, of a conflict over power and resources, of which the Syrians are turning into victims of regional arms. Uh, uh, and uh, interest, and that's a real shame and tragedy in this conflict. I wonder if we can end on a human note. Do we have one more slide from Professor Shannon that we can put up here? Oh, this what is... What are uh, we looking at? We're going to My favorite cafe in Damascus, Nahura Cafe, and this is the traditional storyteller, Hakewati. And that's what I try to do in my work, is tell stories of the actual people who are now suffering, but who still have this wonderful joie de vivre, uh, and still go to this cafe and hear the stories of the their ancestral heroes, uh, and hopefully someday soon I'll be able to join them there again, and, and we all can. And I'm glad we could Syria. end on that personal note. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Perry. And Vali Nasser, thank you. Thank you. Up next, the brilliant bungled ATM heist. Recently, we all were amazed to hear news about a small group of thieves draining ATM machines around New York City in an attack coordinated worldwide that netted over $45 million. Experts have seen this type of heist before. What surprised them was the speed and scale at which it was carried out. It appears to signal a new era in global organized cybercrime with experts of all kinds in secret communication. So what can business and law enforcement do to prevent it happening again? Joining us, former computer crime prosecutor and current New York Law School professor Ken Citarella and via Skype from Scottsdale, Arizona, fraud prevention expert David Britton from the anti-fraud firm 41st Parameter. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. And Thank you, Brett. David, lay out the basics for people who don't get it. Beyond what I just said, what actually happened here? Yeah, it's kind of an interesting mix of things. But uh, 
essentially a group of individuals from somewhere in cyberspace went through and, uh, and uh, were able to hack into a system, it seems, to be able to modify debit card balance uh, amounts. And uh, then we're able to distribute those debit cards to uh, gangs working on the ground. And then at a certain moment when the trigger was pulled, uh, they were they just uh, were able to coordinate a, a massive takedown effort using those debit cards at ATM machines uh, globally. And so, Ken, what's actually new here? Why are people saying this brings us into a new era of cybercrime? Well, I think what we're looking at is the level of sophistication that, that gets everybody's attention. Uh, computer crime has changed a lot over the two decades that we've been concerned with it. Uh, first, it would look mostly like a crime of, of ego. I can break into your system because you can't stop me, and that gives me bragging rights in the computer underground. But what we're looking at, at here, as we've, as we've heard, is a very sophisticated organization in which you had planners, you had programmers, you had coordinators, you had mules going up to the ATMs to actually make the withdrawals. And somebody had to organize all of that and give everybody roles and enforce those roles. Organized crime yes. in a business sense, vertical integration. Correct. This is the kind of thing that we're seeing in the malware industry now, too, where it is organized crime that people will write malware, even though they're never going to use it, but they'll make it available to those who need it, and they'll customize it to specific targets. David, I guess, in theory, then, this kind of crime can be spearheaded from anywhere on the globe. Any idea where this came from? You know, that's uh, the, the only thing we can say with certainty is that it happened somewhere in cyberspace. But unfortunately, um, uh, getting to the geographic specifics, uh, we don't, it's even difficult to say that this may have come from one location. Uh, as Ken was just indicating, you know, the, the fact is these groups actually have, they specialize in various activities. There are those that generate the malware. There are those that distribute the malware. Those are, there are going to be those that are actually responsible for the takedown. So sort of putting a finger point on where it happened, we can say pretty emphatically, yeah, it happened in cyberspace. But geographically, those are the kinds of questions that become less relevant over time in an anonymous environment like the Internet. And yet, can these organizers at the top, whoever they are, wherever they are, and the mules at the bottom, the guys we saw in the video surveillance camera mm -hmm. video on television, uh, going from ATM to ATM with their backpacks <laughs> getting bigger and heavier. Stuffed with stop, money. Somehow they find each other. Right. Um, you know, people who are looking to employ certain people to commit a crime and people who are willing to be employed have always been able to find each, each other. Uh, several years back, we prosecuted a case in which an Eastern European ring was, through phishing malware, stealing identities from Americans, and then an American group of college students in upstate New York and Westchester County were purchasing those identities and committing credit card fraud. Well, the two groups never met except in cyberspace, as David is indicating. So it's organized, but also very anonymous to, e to each other. And that's an interesting phenomenon when you study criminology, but it's a real problem for law enforcement. Law enforcement has got to pass that anonym anonymity gap, right. if I can say that correctly, and find their way up the food chain to the organizer of the crime in order to have a really successful prosecution. But David, so do the criminals have to pass that threshold into cyberspace at some point in order to have a successful crime. So for example, why didn't these guys with the backpacks going from ATM to ATM, just keep the money? Who would have come and gotten them if they had? Well, I think it goes to reputation, right? These, these, or, these individuals within the, within the dark side of the, the, the cyberspace that we're dealing with here have reputations to uphold and want to be able to do future business. So for them to bite the hand that feeds them uh, does not bear well for them in the future. So there's this ongoing need for them to stay in somewhat, uh, in somewhat of a level of trust with the, with the organizations that they're working with, if that makes sense. So, David, how do we start to prevent crimes like this? Or how do we up the ante on preventing crimes like this if they're up, upping the ante on what's at stake? Well, I think there's two sides to it. One of them is, you know, the difficult thing is trying to chase it down after the fact. So a lot of the organizations, uh, I think what has to happen sort of globally is that any organization that's doing anything online has to start to look at the various layers of security and the protocols that they've got in place, whether it's technology or process or operations. But then further, 
uh, I, I think that the other challenge that legitimate businesses have, which these illegitimate <laughs> and, uh, enterprising individuals do not have, is that we have to play by the rules where they do not. And so somehow we need to make it more, uh, more palatable, more possible for organizations to react quickly uh, to, the, uh, to the events as they unfold. And what we're seeing is that certain, particularly in the big banks, right, they're starting to move more towards centralized groups that are responsible for the overall health of the online experience uh, for, for their customers and for detection of risk and so on. So I think there, there has to be more of that trend, frankly. And Ken, are there things that prosecutors can do in bringing these criminals to justice that also wind up preventing future crimes in new ways? Well, yes. The, the, the two most important things that prosecutors have to do is to network closely with industry. Uh, the, the people who have the property and become the, the, the victims uh, are basically the containers of the evidence of, of the crime. And that's where law enforcement has to go to be able to, to solve it. Um, the fact that they get to know each other on a personal basis through a number of, of organizations that bring them together is a very large step forward. And it allows uh, law enforcement to be able to network and get information as quickly as possible. The other step is, is that law enforcement has to network internationally. And that's something that happens on a number of levels, not just personal levels, but on uh, mutual law enforcement assistance treaties between nation states. And that's absolutely essential. And can you, I don't want to use the word entrap because that's not legal, but put out some kind of honey pots so people get attracted to it who are planning these kinds of things, you know, that's still on this side of the law? Sure. I mean, a, a honeypot is just, just basically a, a computer system that looks like it contains a lot of interesting stuff, but it really doesn't. And it's designed to capture the information as much as it can of people who are seeking to exploit it. Um, and that can become a source of information as to who might be trying to exploit real systems. There's no entrapment about a, a honeypot. I mean, they're, they're, they're used. The problem is that you can collect so many hits that you'll never know which is the guy that you really want to follow. Right. And David, what should the average consumer think about a crime like this? Should they think, oh my goodness, I really shouldn't buy things online or I shouldn't use PayPal or services like that because my money's not really safe? Or how does this affect the average individual other than looking at these crimes you know, on TV and saying, oh my goodness? You know, I think it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting question, and one that was actually answered in a study somewhat recently. And it said, you know, it said basically uh, those that are actually online, interacting online with their banks and with their merchants, and have that online access, are actually much more um, wise to what's actually going on in their accounts, and therefore are reacting much more quickly than those that may not be online. Uh, which, you know, they, the folks that may be waiting for the monthly statement to come in the mail before they observe anything's gone wrong may take 30 days before they know there's anything wrong with their account if the bank or the organization didn't already stop the, the, the attack from going on. So all that to say, no, I think that we just need to be savvy. There needs to always be an element of education to the consumer about what's going on. Uh, but the truth is that, frankly, uh, the way these crimes are occurring, your data is already out there on the web. If you're a consumer in the 21st century, your data is out there somewhere. Someone is going to be trying to use it. The best thing you can be doing is being informed about your own financial state, your own uh, you know, assets and resources and so on. Yeah. Ryan, if I could add a, a comment to that. Uh, the type of technology that we're talking about, ATMs and other computer-based uh, facilities, are all offered as a means of convenience to consumers. The fact is security is never convenient. And I think what both the banks and the consumers have to move towards is an understanding that perhaps using these, these uh, pieces of equipment and these services should be a little less convenient so that they're a little more secure. Well, thank you both very much for talking about this with us. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. And coming up, a study of home ownership suggests it's not the job creator or a security maker we usually think it is. Owning your own home, even without the 1950s white picket fence, is still the quintessential American dream. But today's public intellectual, our series looking at research that impacts our lives, asks us to rethink that cultural assumption. Joining us today via Skype from Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire, is David Blanchflower. He's an economics professor and co-author of a new study published by the Peterson Institute of International Economics. It finds home ownership tends to slowly destroy jobs, not create them. Professor, 
Hello from New York. Thank you for coming on with us. Good to speak with you, indeed. Provocative conclusion. So let's start with the data. What a question were you looking to answer and what data did you look at? Well, the work started out looking actually across countries and it was driven by an observation that the countries that actually have seen a big increase in unemployment included those that have had big problems in their housing market. So an example is the US, the UK and Spain and Ireland. But the work's mostly about the United States and we look at state uh, states and how home ownership has changed uh, from 1984 to the present day across U.S. states, and we look to see what home, home ownership has done to the housing market, to the labor market, sorry. And you found? Well, what we found was a couple of things. Firstly, with the, the, what you find for, amongst homeowners is homeowners disproportionately are not unemployed. Uh, they tend to be richer and more educated. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is that once these homeowners get into communities, if you like, the home ownership rate rises, what happens, it appears that they have these uh, so-called NIMBY effects or zoning effects, which actually makes it harder for firms to come into those areas, makes it more difficult to set up for firms. And so that ends up actually, even though the, the individual homeowner, if you like, is unemployed, is less likely to be unemployed, in the area, the unemployment rate rises and the employment rate falls. Um, so that's kind of bad. It's a classic kind of zoning effect or a NIMBY effect, if you like. You mean they don't want businesses in the area because businesses pollute and things like that? That seems to be the story. Um, it's it's, it's keep, keep out. You increase the zoning requirements as to... Uh, the rules that people have to go through. In some ways, I hear when I talk to business, it's actually the legal requirements are just really high. I remember speaking to people who wanted to put up windmills, and they say just the, the amount of lawyering that has to be done area to area. So those costs actually rise and discourage firms from coming there. But then what happens to the, to the homeowners is that they turn out to be less mobile. They can't move as quickly as if they were renters. But the other thing which is kind of worrying, back to pollution, is that it ends up, if the jobs aren't coming to people, once they lose their jobs, what do they end up having to do? They can't sell their houses. They end up having to commute longer. So what we see is that home on, rising home le levels of home ownership lower mobility in the U.S., but they also increase commuting times. So you can think that, that the, ho the housing market has negative externalities on the labor market, which is something we really haven't seen before. Would this be the same in a small uh, area like Hanover, New Hampshire, the Upper Valley there, uh, and in a big metro area like New York City? Because here I think um, people assume, well, there's always a place to put another company, even if there is a long commute to those jobs. Uh, you know, with um, 15 million people in the New York City metro area, we're going to find a place somewhere for any well, economic have, development we can yeah. get. Well, I think that's right. Obviously, this is a generalization across all the U.S. states, across the whole of America. And we find it doesn't just relate to the south or to the west, you know, to the southern states or to the mountain states. It seems to apply in, in every area. But I think you put your, your point, you, you sort of focus right. Essentially, what you have is firms can go someplace. They will find some place to go. But it ends up meaning that they're not going to where the homeowners are. And to connect workers to jobs, the workers have to, as you said, the workers have to commute more. So this is some, I mean, it's not, the, the worrying thing is that people interpret this to say that we think home ownership's a bad thing. Well, obviously we don't, because people, if, if the community is set up, schools are better, crime's lower. There are lots of positive aspects to it. But I think a lot of people in the last five years have realized that there are potentially downside risks from the housing market. Lot of attitudes in America towards owning your own home have changed with so many people in negative equity, which makes the population immobile again. One of the conclusions, I'm going to read from your co-author, uh, Andrew Oswald, a quote of his, high home ownership in a nation is like a treacle blanket thrown <laughs> over the surface of the country and economy. With a high degree of, home o of owner occupation, everything slows. You mean the economy is more likely to churn and speed up because people are less rooted in a particular uh, individual dwelling? Well, I think, yes. I hadn't heard, actually. I hadn't heard that comment from Andrew. Um, I think the answer we, we've learned from this great recession 
is that you want mobility, you want flexible housing markets, labor markets, and capital markets. And anything that makes it harder for that to happen causes a problem. I mean, I certainly think people today would say we have a problem in the US housing market. Let me just go to an example in Europe, two, two contrasting examples. Two countries that did really well through this recession are Germany and Switzerland. Low levels of unemployment. It turns out very low levels of home ownership. Two disastrous countries in Europe, Greece and Spain, very high levels of unemployment, 25% or so, and among the highest levels of home ownership that there is. Workers find it hard to be mobile. The housing market presents a rigidity, if you like. So yes, we want to have freely functioning markets. And this is just a market we haven't really focused on. The housing market and the rise in home ownership turns out to have had negative effects on people. There and especially, especially if they bought the house um, for a, for, on a mortgage and now they're sitting in negative equity. Indeed. And it is something we've heard in this country that hasn't gotten the most publicity of any of the aspects of the financial crisis. And that is that there are jobs here and there are people with homes there but they haven't been able to sell those homes because the housing market crashed, and so they're right. stuck from moving from here to there. But there are many variables that affect the creation right. or destruction of jobs. In order to do this study in a scientific way, did you correct for any particular variables? Well, uh, we essentially, what, this is, if you like, the definitive study so far on, 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 this, on, the, on the home ownership and, and the labor market. So we actually have the full data available from the United States for all the states from 1984. And we include all sorts of other things. We look to see, is it because of union membership? Is it because of um, gender and race and, and levels of education? So we can, we can tr if you like, in technical terms, we control for all of those things. And we control for the unchanging characteristics of the, of the state. So we really want to focus on, on, on changes and, what, and what's changed over time. So essentially, in the technical terms, we did a lot of controlling for stuff. And once you did that, you still find these very strong effects. And, we, and, it's, and it's not just a, an effect that's on one thing. No matter what you look at, if it's unemployment or employment or, or how many firms are created or how many small firms are created, you get the same results. And this, this result doesn't look to be fragile. It looks to be very solid. It's not, it's not like the, that paper we heard about last week, which is the Reinhardt Rogart paper, that you really, once you start to look into the entrails of it, sort of crumbles. It does, I, I really don't think it's like that. What, what was that one? I'd love to hear the critique. Oh, this was uh, the paper by Reinhardt and Rogoff, the, famous, the world's most famous graduate student, Thomas Herndon, discovered, um, if he looked inside the data and he looked at the spreadsheets, the conclusion the austerity people had used, which was that, um, that the growth collapsed once you got to a 90% debt to GDP ratio, that appeared not to be true. So this has caused a big controversy in economics over the last um, couple of weeks or so. Um, assuming that what you've noticed is true and is solid. Oh, well, you, let's assume that. That seems. <laughs> that's that's a good scientific assumption to start with. Assume we are right. <laughs> um, why do you think nobody ever noticed it before? Um, I think one of the things that the confusion here is obviously that I started out from the, the evidence that, first of all, um, the homeowners themselves tend not to be unemployed. So that's the first thing. So that's the first observation. It doesn't, doesn't kind of fit that well. But the other thing which takes a while for people to notice is that these effects on the home ownership rate take quite a long time to have an effect. We find it takes about five years for a change in the home ownership rate to actually impact the labor market. June is National Homeowners Month in the United States, which you may or may not already know. You think we should change it to National Renters Month? Well, I think it's quite clear there are positive benefits to being a homeowner. We've seen that. But that and there are particularly um, good schools tend to go with good communities. So obviously communities are important, but we should counter that by saying it does appear there are externalities to the labor market that we ought to take into consideration. I was just on another program a little earlier with um, um, Judd Gregg, previous senator from, from New Hampshire, who was very unhappy about these results, didn't, didn't like them, didn't think they were very American, although he not, doesn't apparently actually looked at them, but didn't like them, thought that they had very bad implications for the United States. This, however, it's not, this is not a 
a thesis of ours. It's not a position we're trying to push. We are trying to show here's the evidence in the data. Um, surely we must um, look at the data, take it seriously, try and think about what the consequences are of what we're doing, right. and come up with better policies. But I think that the bottom line I would give is maybe it is National Homeowners Month, and I own my own home, and I, you know, I like it, and it's fine. So that's okay. But I think the other thing we mustn't forget is a freely functioning private rental sector is very helpful for an economy. And we, and one of the great benefits of the United States is we have one of those, unlike in lots of countries that don't. So this freely functioning private rental sector helps people to move. If you want to think about relocating and going to Los Angeles, it's easier to go there and find a renter, a rent and stay there for a while and look into uh, what you're going to do next. So this, in a way, I'm happy for the, the home ownership a month, but we also have to be aware that renting places is also good. Well, just real quick, and we got to go, there are downsides to a lot of people renting. For example, your nest doesn't become your nest egg. You're just throwing your housing money every month at your landlord. Well, that, that's true, but obviously it's, for many people, they would have been better off from 2007 to today renting rather than owning a home because they would not have made this huge capital loss, which had all their savings in there. So obviously there, there are positives and there are negatives to both. Um, and we've just shown that this, 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 the housing market may well have positive effects right. on all sorts of things. I mean, imagine it, let's say, it lowers crime. Great. But if it's having an effect on the labor market, we need to think about that, put that into our calculations, um, and decide what to do from there. It, right. But we should always be confronting the evidence and the data, and that's what we've been trying to come up with. Do you live in a nice little rental apartment there in Hanover? No. <laughs> I said that. I said that, I but I also that. value the fact that if I want to go and leave somewhere for a, for a while, I can go and rent, a, rent an apartment. I go and go to, the, go to the south for a while, I can rent somewhere. So both things are fine. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you discussing your study with us. Thank you. Up next, extraordinary images like this one from the Iraq War. No filter. That's probably the only way to describe the blunt and uncomfortably honest depictions in a new book out this month, Photojournalists on War, the Untold Stories from Iraq. It's a hefty coffee table offering of candid interviews and especially censored photographs from 39 of the world's top photojournalists. We'll see some. And it was all pulled together by one of their own. Michael Camber, who joins us today, covered the Iraq War as a writer and photographer for the New York Times from 2003 to 2012. And next to him is Ashley Gilbertson, who also covered Iraq for the Times from 2002 to 2008. We'll see some of his work today. Welcome to both of you. Thank Michael, you. I'll start with you before we put up some images. What were you trying to do with this book? I was coming back to the US. Uh, you know, I was working in Iraq constantly, coming back and forth. And I wasn't really seeing a history of the war that I felt represented uh, what I was seeing, what my experience was in Iraq. That was my real goal, was just to, I felt the need to to set something down that people could look, look at for, uh, hopefully, for generations. Well, let me just start with an image, and you tell us what we're looking at here. I gather this is from Baghdad in February of 2003, which actually would have been about a month before the war began, right? Yeah. This is a very uh, early image uh, from before the hostilities, and uh, it really shows daily life in Baghdad. And uh, I think this was taken downtown uh, near Sadun Street, um, it's a real cafe society there, very, very communal. Men gather all the time to, to uh, smoke and drink uh, tea in these cafes. And it really shows what life was like before the war. So let's go to slide number two, and we're flashing forward ahead two months, April 7th, 2003, in Basra. So this is about a month into the war. Yeah, yeah. This is a photo by Alan Chin, and uh, these are actually British troops, troops in the foreground. and. Uh, this is the invasion as it's taking place. This was actually two days before uh, Baghdad fell. And there was, they were taking sniper fire uh, from a school in the background, and they responded with, with uh, heavy artillery. And it's so surreal. It almost looks like a painting, honestly. Yeah, yeah. We tried also to choose photos that were striking visually, you know, as well as, of course, the information was paramount. 
Uh, let's go on to the next slide, and this is from the same day, April 7th, 2003, in Diwania, is that how you say it? Diwania. And? This was a photo by Gary Knight. He was working for Newsweek at the time, and he was with uh, a group of Marines. They took fire, uh, artillery fire. He believes it was friendly fire, actually. He believes it was a, a, a you know, mistaken location hit. And um, the Marines here are evacuating their dead. Uh, there was a, a hit on a, uh, an American vehicle. They were pulling the dead out of the vehicle and, uh, and trying to get them medical care as quickly as possible. Now, before we go to the first of your photos that we're going to um, look at, Ashley, <clears throat> did it take any convincing for you to participate in this project? No, absolutely not. I had full faith that Mike would be able to but shine a light on things that had been really underreported, which I think was the personal experiences of the photographers and what we had been unable to, you know, really say as both members of the media and as as personal as, as human beings. Um, so it, I'm very outspoken, though. Like I don't need any convincing to yes. talk. So even in the Times, I mean, people think of the Times as, I think, having published <laughs> some extremely moving and horrifying pictures of the Iraq war during the Iraq war and yet would you consider the photos in this book either censored to use that word or too edgy somehow for publication in the Times? Some of the pictures in this book are definitely too edgy for publication in the Times or really I would say anywhere outside of this book. I mean there's some really brutal pictures that I'm not comfortable looking at and I've, I've spent you know on and off years looking you know firsthand at these things. Um, it's not easy material, but it's stuff that we do need to look at and acknowledge Why? that it's there because we need to take responsibility for the things that we have done. Um, and I should say that we are not putting the most difficult pictures to look at here on your television screen tonight, but we are giving you some incredible examples of photos from this book and letting you know of its existence. So let's take a look at uh, one of your shots Ashley, and do you want to describe this for us? It almost <laughs> looks like a guy sliding down a banister. But exactly it's exactly what it is. It. it is. It is. Yeah, it's. it's uh, he's been nicknamed the slider. Um, I, I was in Tikrit, uh, which was the last major city in Iraq to fall to Allied forces, and the Americans were there. So I walked up as an unembedded journalist, or unilateral, we were called, um, and I was told by this like totally overweight guy with his like belly hanging out from underneath his uniform, like, oh, God, this is disgusting. What's going on? And the guy said, "You can't talk to the soldiers. I'm sorry." but you're not embedded. Like, what are you talking about? Who are you to say that? He's like, I'm a reporter. <laughs> He's wearing a uniform. Anyway, so I, um, I was still walking, there, walking around the palace, and um, I bumped into this guy and his friend, who hopped onto the banister and slid down. So I took a picture thinking, I have, like, essentially a happy snap from Tikrit. Mm -hmm. And then I drove, you know, down to Kabul and Baghdad. I saw there was a thousand reporters in Baghdad. I hot-footed it out of there. Sent this back to the States thinking, like, look, this is a funny picture. And it turns up double page in Time magazine and launched my career. And Oops. you feel weird about that? Yeah, really weird. Why? <laughs> because I just, I thought it was like a silly little moment that wasn't so representative of anything. Of course, back in the United States, people were looking for something to say, look, the last major city in Iraq fell. Like, let's find the celebration picture. Of course, there wasn't a celebration picture. Combat activities didn't stop. You know, there wasn't a mission accomplished. If anything, it got worse after the last city fell. That's when the insurgency started to really develop and, and the seeds of it were planted. To have a celebration picture wasn't my experience. I'm not going to deny the fact that that launched my career and thanks, Slider, but... <laughs> and here's another shot from the same city. This is Saddam Hussein's hometown to Crete, right? Yeah. Uh, the very next day, April 15th, still about a month into the war, Michael, talk about this. This is not one of Ashley's photos. This is Lindsay Adario, uh, one of the great female war photographers. And uh, it's basically a group of uh, soldiers you know, waking up in the morning, uh, bathing as best they can, shaving, brushing their teeth, just sort of the everyday behind the scenes stuff that we, we rarely see in the newspapers. And uh, we included it because we felt like it gave a, a view of, of what the U.S. troops' uh, life is like. You know, they're not always out there firing a gun. I, I can't make it out, but this is described to me as these soldiers shaving and cleaning themselves in front of one of Saddam Hussein's palaces. Is that the context? Yeah, exactly. Very much so. And the palaces actually were being looted at this point. And uh, I mean, that, that uh, proved disastrous. I think it was uh, nine or 10 days the looting went on pretty much 
uh, you know, unfettered, un, un, uh, uncontrolled. One of the turning points of the war, that and, the U.S., yes. that Secretary Rumsfeld didn't act more quickly there, and he basically said stuff happens in war. Yeah, yeah. and that, you know, that end, uh, ended up costing hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, which all had to be paid for by the U.S. taxpayers. We had to rebuild all that stuff eventually. It also sent a very strong message to the Iraqis that we did not have our act together, and we were not prepared to control the country in the post-war era. Ashley told the story of seeing that banister photo one way and the editor seeing it a whole other way. Is that a running theme that photojournalists in a war zone see their work in a certain light and their editors see it differently? I heard that from a lot of photojournalists. Um, I can't say it was universal because different people worked for different publications. I actually had a pretty good experience at the New York Times. Um, I quote Gary Knight in the book. And he talks about sending back photos uh, of the statue falling. And he talks about how that was a really a rather minor event. And his editors in New York were telling him, we're doing a story about uh, the liberation. And he's saying, well, we don't see a liberation. We see an occupation. And they're saying, no, no, we've decided that the story is going to be liberation. We want you to take those photos. And we did hear that, hear that from some uh, photographers. All right, let's keep looking at some shots. And we move on to some tougher stuff here. The date is May 27th, 2003, still the first year of the war, a few months in. Uh, Michael, I'll go back to you to describe this. This is uh, Marco De Lauro's photo. Uh, he's a, uh, one of the great uh, Italian photojournalists. And he basically, uh, I think this is from uh, El Musayib. This was a mass grave that was uncovered. And these were people who were actually killed during the uh, earlier uprising. The Americans were not involved in this, so I want to be clear about this. Um, this was a Shia uprising uh, during the first Gulf War. Uh, of course, the Americans were expected to come in and lend support, and they right. didn't. It was really after the first Gulf War. It was after the first Gulf War, during the Shia uprising. Where yeah. the indication was that we got your back and we'll come in and help you overthrow right. Saddam Hussein, even though yeah. President George H.W. Bush and Colin Powell didn't go all the way to Baghdad. Right? Exactly, exactly. These uh, people, now these, these people are bodies, up. rows of bodies and body bags. Is that what I'm looking at? Exactly. They've all, these are bodies that have been dug up out of the ground and they're in rows waiting for identification. And there's a boy jumping over the bodies. And uh, Marco always said this photo really shocked him because it showed you how people could get so used to the carnage over a period of time. Yeah, and it looks like an innocent shot of a boy jumping over whatever it right. might have been. Of course, you can't tell really from the still, but it looks so playful on yeah, the child's part. It does. But in this gruesome context. So let's go on to the next slide. And this is Balad, July 16th, yeah. 2003. The, pho the photographer is Rita Leisner. Rita Leisner, Canadian photojournalist. And oh, the, the, great, the great story that she told me was she was taking these photos relatively early on in the war, uh, I would say the occupation. And when American soldiers, particularly with the 4th ID, would get shot at. They would go into the nearest village and they would arrest all the men between 16 and 60 and send them to Abu Ghraib, where many of them would languish for years without legal representation. And the shocking thing was that she was sending these photos back to the U.S. and nobody would publish the photos because they said that they weren't representative of what was really happening. Once the Abu Ghraib photos came out the following year, suddenly everybody rushed to get these photos from her and they were published all over the world. And now over a year later to the next shot, and Ashley, this is yours, from Fallujah in November of 2004. Can you talk about it? Yeah, I, um, it was during the second offensive to retake Fallujah. You know, the U.S. Marines sent in uh, 15,000 15, service members to take back the city from the insurgents. And, you know, it was the most extreme and severe week of sustained combat I've ever experienced. And this was towards the end of that week. They, these three men had come out in front of a house that the Marines were actually stationed in. And they, um, they had their hands up and they were told to take off their shirts to show they weren't wearing um, suicide belts. Um, and the Marines took them in. They, um, they asked them what they were doing. The kids said they were at university. I mean, they were, they were you know, late teenagers, early 20s. Um, and the Marines said, yeah, University of Jihad. And then, um, put them on the ground and waited for them to be taken away. But I spent a long time making this picture, and it's turned into the one that I feel is the most representative of my time in Iraq. It's or of how I understand war. And I know this is all very personal. But in this picture, there's no faces. It's, it's symbolic. You're looking at a symbol of the insurgency, a symbol of US military might. Like you 
can't fight a war if you know that you're killing, you know, Haji Muhammad who, have eight, who has eight kids that love him. Or it's a lot harder to fight that war. It's a lot harder to push the button as a Humvee drives by and you, you know that you're going to kill Brian Smith, you know, who's from Pearland, Texas, and his parents will weep every day for the rest of their lives knowing that he's gone. This picture to me represents that depersonalization and the, and the sanitation of how we fight war and what we should fight against. I'm told that both of you supported the war going in and then had changes of heart during. Michael, is that true for you? It is true for me, yeah. I, I was covering wars in West Africa previously and uh, had covered some brutal dictatorships. And uh, I, to be honest with you, I knew very little about the Middle East. You know, I'd, I'd worked in Africa and, you know, other places in the world. Um, but I didn't really understand the Middle East or, or the dynamics in Iraq. And I thought, this will be pretty simple. You know, we'll go in there, we'll overthrow this guy and hold elections and everything will be fine. Somebody told us it was going to be a cakewalk. That's and, what. <laughs> and the overthrowing Saddam Hussein part was not that hard. It was very easy. Yeah, yeah. But, but we were all unprepared for the complexities of what came next. It was an enormously uh, complex situation. And uh, we went in there. I mean, you can see it in a number of books, you know, that, that detail this. But uh, I mean, we literally went in there. We went in and overthrew, uh, you know, the leader and the army of a country of 29 million people with no post-war plan. And that's just mind-boggling. Ashley, how about for you? You started out thinking it would be a good thing on balance? Yeah, I mean, I'd worked in Iraq in 2002 and then again well before the war in 2003. And I had a lot of friends, you know, up in the Kurdish north who had lost family members and who had been tortured. You know, some of whom are still receiving treatment to this day for the torture that they received at the hands of Saddam's henchmen. I figured, as perhaps a naive 24-year-old, that anything would be better than Saddam in power. I realize now, as a 35-year-old, that I was wrong, that it actually got a lot worse. And so now, as people say, the US, the West, the world has to come and rescue Syrians from Assad, do you look at that with a certain eye from your experience? I'm really conflicted about intervention. It's a really difficult part of the world, but I also don't believe in standing by and watching what happened in, whether it's Yugoslavia or Rwanda, and standing idly by again. That said, maybe a no-fly zone, I don't know. I don't know what the right thing to do is. I'm really conflicted about this. 80,000 people have died in Syria. What should we do? I haven't got the answers. I wish I did. I really do. Michael? I think, uh, looking at it, it's a, a quagmire waiting to happen. I mean, Hezbollah is involved, you know, Lebanon's involved, um, there are Iraqi jihadists involved. I mean, there's people from all over the Middle East uh, involved in that conflict. I think uh, for us to step into that, uh, I don't think the American people have the stomach, and I think it would be a mistake. Ashley, take a last word and describe this final photograph that will show of yours. Hmm. This is the picture that um, almost led to the to the work that I've been doing about veterans <clears throat> and post-traumatic stress around the United States for the, for the following five years. But this is in um, 2008, and it's a mass re-enlistment ceremony with over a thousand soldiers, Marines, and airmen um, and sailors re-enlisted at the same time in one of Saddam's old palaces. But in looking at this picture over and over again, I've often thought about why you would have so many people be re-upping at once. I mean, of course, there's people there that are waving the flag and saying, it's God bless America, and this is why I'm doing it. But I know that there's a lot of people in that room that are going to stay in Iraq and are going to go to Afghanistan to try to get vengeance for what happened, that are staying in because of a duty to their friend that maybe they had lost. And to me, that is what drew me back to the United States to start looking at the post-war experience and how we could take responsibility for what we did here as well as there. So even here, more photos to be taken, more truth to be shown, more witness to be born. Yeah. Thank you both very much. Our pleasure. And that's our program for this week. We're here Wednesday evenings at 7.30. Next week, the war on federal whistleblowers. And an artist facing street harassment says, draw. And do tune into my radio program weekdays 10 a.m. till noon on WNYC 93.9 FM and AM 820. Tomorrow, New York Times Chief Washington Correspondent David Sanger on leaks, security, and freedom of the press. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.